Welcome to the Signature Leadership Show. I'm Jamie Mason Cohen, and this is where we explore world-class leaders discovering their authentic selves, and in the process, we discover our own. Today we have, first, the co-interviewer is Dr. Nick Mays. Nick is a former colleague of mine who is a author of several young adult novels. He also has a PhD in the classics. We're also interviewing Jack Healy. Jack Healy has been called Mr. Human Rights. There is no one that I know of, based on the research that I've done in the past 60 or so years, who's done more behind the scenes to further the causes of human rights, a whole wide range of human rights causes around the world, than my friend of 25 years, Jack Healy. He's also the author of the book, Create your future, how to make your voice heard from civil rights to human rights, from anti-apartheid to anti-war. Thank you both for being here. You're welcome. Pleasure. Jack, what's on your mind right now in the world of human rights? I feel like in terms of the U.S., my country, we're back in the 50s again, and our country split and we're in terrible danger of, of not realizing the potential of democracy and freedom and equality. Tell me more on that line. I'm, I'm interested in that. <laughs> if you look at the map of those who support Trump and those who support Biden, it's almost like you're looking into Confederacy again. And that map worries me. Um, I thought we'd moved in the 60s, you know, with Dr. King's leadership. I thought we'd moved forward and a lot of diversity started, not, not a lot of diversity, but diversity did start, at least became a national narrative. It hasn't produced what we needed yet, but I think we failed in two things in my generation, which were, you know, my age, we're gonna probably leave behind, is the lack of true equality in the United States, as well as economic justice for the poor. We just have too many poor people in the United States with such power and wealth that we can do anything in the world except take care of our own poor. That is worrisome to me. Capitalism without compassion is, is, is arrogant and stupid. With compassion, it can make it work. You can, it keeps flexible and it, it keeps, you can work with it. Compassion does not have, uh, it turn, without compassion, there's cruelty in it. And, and cruelty is our poor. Uh, that's the result of that kind of capitalism on steroids. I think I share many of your concerns here, especially since I think that the income divide has just become more pointed than it's been really since the Gilded Age in the United States. Uh, from a political point of view, I, I really do not want to see Trump reelected, but I sometimes wonder whether it's not darkest before the dawn. And I only mean that in the sense that the demographics of the United States has changed so markedly since you were active in the 1950s and 60s with, with Martin Luther King. That is to say, when you when you actually look at the number of white people living in the United States, within the next 20 to 30 years, they will be in the minority. And, and, and the same is true of Canada. If you, were, if you were to look at Canada in 1958, that's, that's where I'm speaking from, 90% of the population was white and Christian. And within the next 20 to 30 years, it'll be closer to 50%. And when you have a demographic change like that, and you have an operable democracy when people are actually allowed to vote, it seems to me that change is in the offing. It's, it's just going to come about. And I wonder whether we don't see almost a certain desperation on the part of the last diehards, generally speaking, older white males who perhaps are looking back to an era where you did not have the civil rights mm -hmm. as solidly entrenched as, as they would be today. And of course, there's still a lot of work to be done. But given the fact that I think they see change coming down the road, is it possible that even if, even if, and I, I really tell myself this as, a, as an act of comfort, even if a Donald Trump were to become elected, it's, it's, really just, it's really just the last hurrah of an old system, which is, which is tottering. Any, any thoughts about that? I, I, I appreciate, appreciate your, your opinion, Nick. My worry is, is once Franco takes over Spain, they stay. And that's what I worry about our country. When you make that gigantic shift to autocratic leadership instead of to democratic leadership, uh, and I don't mean 
Democrat in the big capital. Yeah, of course. Capital, is that the world? The world right now in Spain, Hungary, Italy, uh, parts of England. Uh, there are shifts to the to the hard right that that are dip, are ma making what you said difficult for me. On the other hand, what we really need in the world is some symbols of hope. In my time, I had Dr. King, I had Mandela. You know, we had Obama come along. We we had symbols. We're, we're lacking symbols here in our country. Like if you ask us who's the who's the moral leader in the United States, I wouldn't really know. I wouldn't be able to say. Yes. I, we 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 got to find those symbols of hope. I think for people to be looking up at something bigger than themselves, and I'm hoping they come along. And I hope your optimism is appropriate and and it happens because the there's a lot at stake if the biggest country or, the, or a powerful country like ours, like the United States, falls to that kind of idiocy. It kind of means we are him, not not the other way around. And that is so scary to me that I, I, you know, I kind of, it scares me as, as a. No, I understand why. I do. Freedom loving person. Yeah. Jack, you mentioned a lack of moral leadership and an absence of signs of hope right now on the political landscape and beyond. Of the different leaders, moral leaders you worked with, collaborated with, performed forms of nonviolent resistance with over the past decades. I know there's many. Who's one who really exemplified to you what moral leadership looks like? That probably would be the easiest for me. He was a friend of mine, so I speak from a friend point of view, is John Lewis. Um, John was a Alabama farmer, started preaching at nine years old, Gave the speech along with Dr. King at the important day at the at the uh, Lincoln Memorial when Dr. King gave probably the greatest speech of that century. John was the same person behind the door as in front of the door, and uh, he and I were were dear friends from the moment we met. I don't know how to explain it, but he he'd call me to go shopping and tell him I'm not going shopping with you because everybody likes you. We'll never get done shopping. <laughs> and one time Dick Gregory told him he was. He was the ugliest guy in the civil rights movement. John came to me and said, Jack, am I really the ugliest guy in the human rights movement? I said, John, he's a comedian. He's what kidding. was it about him? What was it about him if you could quantify or, or he he really was a symbol of hope because he lived, he was like a walking declaration of independence or a walking universal declaration of human rights. He, he was, it, it was he was fun to be with. He if he saw me across the street, he'd say, "Hey, Jack, Jack, come on, walk to me, in Congress." I, said, I don't like walking with you. You got up there writing those bad laws, and no, no, tell me what you're doing. It was a it was a lovely exchange of friendship that I was lucky to get to know. On a shorter version, the luckiest one was Fannie Lou Hamer of Mississippi. I made her the chair of our international walk for development. We were raising money against world hunger. And um, she was just probably the most powerful, aside from Rosa Parks, probably the greatest woman in the civil rights movement and uh, dearly loved her. And she was she was delighted that we brought her back into the 70 walks because she felt the civil rights movement had left her behind, kind of. And she she felt resurrected in a way with what we were doing. And I was pleased to be able to do that and share that with her. Then it, when she was... We won the, Dick Gregory won the Dawson Award for running across the United States for world hunger. And we were at the Black Caucus dinner in DC and I was Dick's guest of honor. And Fannie Lou's at the table and she leans over and takes my hand and says, Jack, I'm dying. I am with God. Don't you worry about me. I'll see you on the other side. And that was the, that was the end of that. And she died kind of young. Uh, but that was another great leader that I thought uh, that did not surface appropriately in our country, but was still that great leader. I was wondering, I mean, Dr. King and um, John Lewis, Fanny, all these people, they, they really came from some type of religious background, as did you, of course. And I think what I really liked about the memoir was that you, in a sense, extracted from your background exactly what your mother thought of the Catholic church consisting of love and 
charity and working for the poor and widows and so on and so forth. And you left the institutional part behind. In fact, I strongly imagine you're allergic to anything institutional, but that's just my opinion. But it's interesting too, how some of the singers that you worked with, Sting and Bono and Springsteen, they too came from a Catholic background and they seem to have extracted the, the goodness of religion without its institutionality. And I guess my question to you too, if, if I'm onto something here, I guess my question to you is, are you worried that when you look at a younger generation that hasn't really had religious instruction in the way that people from Springsteen's generation and your generation have, do you think that that could act as something of um, an obstacle to their appreciation of the fundamental nature of human rights? I, I think in some ways on the music side, it helped me to be an ex-priest, not a priest. They wanted to talk to someone distant from the right. structure. I, I think that was a seriously under, under it all. I think that was present. Also, who got me the talent of Springsteen and U2 was Frank Barcelona, who was very Catholic and loved his ex-priest too. And he, he doesn't show up anywhere, but he's a premier talent. He's the one that loved what I was doing. He saw the value of it and, and backed me. Uh, I would not have been able to do what I did without him. And he was very Catholic. I remember one time he and Bill Graham were in a battle and I said, oh, oh good, I, I can go because this has nothing to do with me. <laughs> Frank said, no, you're next priest. You're staying for this. I said, oh, geez. <laughs> I wanted out of there so badly. But I, I think the present generation, I think they're much better than my generation on, on the issue of integration and diversity. I think they just share that value. And, and that is like a blessing for the country. Uh, I think on the other hand, I walk every day, twice a day. I think some of them think I'm a tree, you know, <laughs> I mean, they, they don't show much manners for the young, for the old or, or the speed of these bow pads that they go 20 mile an hour on. If they hit one of us, uh, I'd be dead. And th there doesn't seem to be any concern in their mind about coming close to you and scaring the shit out of you. So I, I worry about that side of the personality. I don't know whether that comes for, from a lack of religion or, or, a, or no, you know, I don't know. I don't have a clue. But I'm, I'm worried that we're turning over to them a very big job. And I think where this is showing up is, I'm like a, a Democrat, but not, not I'm a sort of, I don't know what kind of Democrat I am, but Biden is doing a reasonably good job. At least he's returned sanity to the country of, in some sort. And they don't, I think they just look at him and look old. He looks old and decrepit, though the policies are quite good. I think they, there is a bit of ageism in this that affects his presidency, which is quite serious, I think. I don't know where they get that or how they get that, but I worry about, I worry about them because I love their sense of diversity. I'm very proud of that, for, of them. I think the one, if that's my strategy, given that that's my strategy and has been, I think the great failure is the turning of Aung San Suu Kyi from a heroic human rights figure to a complete loss when she supported leave, pushing out all the people in the, in the rocking county or a state up there into the little island off, you know, terrible place to live off uh, Bangladesh. And she went to, to Europe at some meeting there. She supported the, the military uh, egg, kicking all those people out of Burma. I think that failure in my time set us all back. We didn't know how, we did not how, know how to adjust it because we had built a rather large, powerful, influential thing behind her, in, at least in the United States. We were all, all there. That failure has, has hurt us. It has hurt us in some significant way, I think. When we lose a symbol of hope like that, I th and we suffered some losses, I think. And so we look like we might be doing things that were good, but not really, doesn't really stick. Do you know what I mean? It, it, it doesn't hold. It, it, you, what happened there, Jack? Come on, you know? It's like that, I think. And that's a legitimate, it's a legitimate question. When I reached that chapter, and you, you couldn't have known it at the time, I was just wondering whether perhaps the appropriate analogy was that you were really a surgeon who was operating on someone who needed an operation and needed to be brought back to life, but you don't know what they're going to do once you've actually brought them back to life. And perhaps it's not really 
that's not really your domain. You can't, you can't have been expected to have predicted how she would behave once you actually gave her back the freedom that she was unquestionably. Somebody we were warned by uh, one of the Burmese kids. He said that we shouldn't turn her into a personality because there's a great nationalistic instinct in the Burman majority against the minorities in the country. Interesting. And she belongs to them and she, they'll always support her. But that's the problem is whatever their problems are, they're going to they're going to go against the minorities in right. the region, whichever side or not, doesn't matter. She's they're against them all. That nationalism yes. is might. And they're the they're 60, 80 percent of the country. Mm -hmm. That That's I think we ran into a nationalistic instinct. I think. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Jack, with Aung San Suu Kyi, which is when I first met you, that was the cause that I volunteered with. So I really followed that over the years and well beyond when I initially heard about it through you in the late 90s. With Aung San Suu Kyi, she's a fascinating example of one of the themes we spoke about at the beginning of this conversation with the three of us, which is the failure of moral leadership. In Aung San Suu Kyi's case, what do you think it was with this woman who exemplified so many positive elements of leadership at some point, charismatic leadership, bravery in the face of evil, and the ability to rally uh, and persuade her people behind a cause? What do you think it was about Aung San Suu Kyi's lack of or falling from grace in terms of moral leadership that we can take away so that when we go out in the world, we make sure to learn from those failures? I think in, in short, Jamie, um, her father was killed at a very young age. She lost him, I think, like, like I did. Uh, my father died at two. Um, I think in some ways, he was the leader of, of the Burman majority. And we didn't see it that way. He was the leader of Burma. He actually was the leader of the Burman majority, in the, in, which was the larger population. And I think she just was always, she belonged to the nationalistic instinct of the country, as, as did her father. And she missed him and continued his beliefs. Uh, that's, that's my guess, because I don't have any proof of that. I'm not a scholar of her or her dad. But my, my sense is that what we're battling inside of that is is a truly a nationalistic instinct. We've had people that worked in the Burma campaign in Washington who, when it came time, they, they were paid by the Burmese kind of community. When it came time for to write an article again in support of the Rohingyas staying within Burma, where they have always been for centuries, um, that he, he, he would not... He would not continue with the organization and had to be fired because he wouldn't agree even after working there all those years. It was shocking to us. So the nationalist instinct became loomed larger for me and, and perhaps something for me to understand. That was a mistake. We, we made her too big of a figure, maybe. It's a fascinating question about human rights when one thinks of a corrupt leadership or, or an errant leadership that one's fighting or, or a population. And, mm. and what I mean by that is I could, I could see that the battle is, however hard it is, is easier if you're dealing with, for example, an apartheid regime, which is promoted by a minority of what, no, a, a minority of the population as a whole. And even within that minority, you've got many, many dissenting voices. I could see how you could turn that population around, even as I could see when Martin Luther King actually takes the podium and speaks that. Those, those marvelous words, I think, I think the population was tired of this in some ways. I mean, the bulk of, the Amer bulk of America, I think they were really tired by this, this, this Jim Crow system. Uh, maybe, not, maybe you wouldn't have seen that same degree of fatigue in the South as, as, as much as in the North, but the population was ready for some type of reform. But what do you do with the population when, when the population itself is backing someone is actually, it's the minority that is saying, we know what this person stands for, and we're willing to abide by this person's principles, which I guess would take us back not only to Burma, but also potentially to a Trump election. This may be a little heavy handed. This may be heavy handed, but you know, Lincoln was assassinated, or I think that, that, 
that Jim Crow that came back after you know the Southern oppression and, and you know black minorities, it really stopped history. Just like it stopped history and Dr. King was killed and John Kennedy was killed and Edgar Evers. These are brilliant, brilliant people who are taken out before their time. We lose that leadership. It, it's I think it's terribly important. And when it comes to the civil to the civil war, I think we don't know what it would have been like because he may have dealt with that, that we still needed structures through the South to, to control the return of white power. Uh, and I think that might have happened under him. I don't know whether that's realistic or not, but we we've seen we've seen in our time, just in my life, you know, I used to say, Dick. To Dick Gregory, you know, Dick, you've lost so many of your friends, Malcolm X, I, you know, we keep naming them, the blacks were shot and killed. And I said, what did that do to you? And he said, it, it doesn't soften you, it hardens you. And so, you know, it, it was, a, you know, I don't know the answer to our own history, but I, I think we oftentimes, governments know who to kill. Like they, Stephen Biko is black consciousness. If Stephen Biko would have lived, would have turned into the Mandela of his time, except with 40 more years to live. And that would have changed South Africa because he was brilliant. He was totally brilliant. And, and with the killing of Chris Haney, the military leader of the African National Congress, who yes, turned out to be a communist, but he was a great human being and would have fit the system in Southern Africa. When they lose those two leaders like that in, in my lifetime after I, I was in Lesotho, and I got to know Chris Haney rather reasonably well because he was in Lesotho at that, my time. I think often history is determined by key leadership being being executed and governments do that, know that, and do go ahead and kill. Jack, if we could jump backward in time to the amnesty years and the concerts, the legendary concerts that you spearheaded and pioneered, for those of you who are a little bit younger and might not be aware of uh, what these concerts were, and Jack can fill in a, a few uh, brush strokes here. These were a series of concerts, a series of different six week, one was six weeks, uh, and there was a few others that featured some of the leading stars, artists of the day from U2, Tracy Chapman, Peter Gabriel, Bruce Springsteen, Sting, and many other international stars as well. And it went across the world. It was a tour that brought attention to human rights in different countries from Chile at the fall of Pinochet's regime in 1990 in the National Stadium and across the world. In a nutshell, in an overview, which it's a significant part of your memoir, what are some of the lessons or takeaways when you reflect back on the amnesty concerts that you put on? I think the, the conspiracy hub was pretty simple, Jamie. We were, when I took over at amnesty, we were about 40,000 members, mostly over 45 years old. And I just come from South Africa, Southern Africa, where I had seen apartheid at work and the refugees coming into Lesotho and me meeting Chris Hani and Phyllis Nadu and getting to know them reasonably well, because we're in this little village of Maseru. I was on fire. I, I knew I'd watch the kids demonstrate. They were, they were, they were always grade school and high school kids demonstrating who, who got beat up and shot and knocked over and imprisoned. It was always sort of the young. Um, so I came into amnesty. I wanted to bring the young abroad, the, the, the young in our country to those young suffering around the world. That was my concept to bring, but I had to build the young into, into amnesty how do I do that? So music is the magical newspaper. So I, I purposely went out and saw Bill Graham with my first trip. A tough guy to deal with, but he he had a big heart, and uh, got in a fight with him, which he liked because he had to fight with you to trust you, I think. <laughs> and we bonded, we bonded well without talking to one another about it. And I wanted to, I wanted to cross the country. I wanted to show the country we were big. If government perceives you as big, you're big, even if you're small. If the perception is big, then, then I thought I could create that with music. So I start hunting for 
musicians. Bill told me to get a con that if I got the talent, he would do the shows, which I said, Bill, that's a contract. He called me a name and <laughs> told me to get out. He said, I know what a contract is. So I, I went back to my roots. I went back to my Irish roots. I, I it was accidental to see you two on a stage because they gave ten thousand dollars to Amnesty and two tickets. And my secretary was begged for the tickets. And I told her, "Sure." I said, "I don't know who this band is anyway." And her boyfriend didn't show up with snow, or I forget what happened. His plane didn't land, so she begged me to go with her. And I saw you two on stage, and they were brilliant. And I thought, "That's my band." I didn't know about backstage. I didn't know any of that. But I was flying to I was flying to Finland for an amnesty meeting. I saw I could drop into Dublin. I thought I'll, I'll go in Dublin and talk to you two and get them to be the closing band. So I did. And I got that agreement with Paul McGinnis, their manager and Bono. And I think Larry was in the room, but I'm not positive of that. But I think, and I, and I said to Bono, are you really Irish? And that set him back. And he said, I think so. Because they like to call us Irish in the United States, plastic, you know, and we're plastic Irish. So I set them back with that question. And then they agreed in about eight minutes, I was back in the cab and uh, I knew we could do that. So we picked, a, we picked a play in every part of the country with Bill. And, and that's what we did. And we luckily broke, luckily for MTV with Bob Pittman, we were able to play 11 hours live at the closing in Giant Stadium and syndicated up on what was then Fox at the time. I forget what they called it at the time. So we, we created almost overnight in a two week period, we were the charity of choice in the United States. And we, we tripled our money and my goal was to hit 3 million to make 3 million clear for Amnesty, we did. We had like uh, 65,000 new members at $25 each within, within six weeks, I think. And, the, and then I would tour giving speeches through all the colleges of the United States. That's how we built the young. I wanted to bond the young in the United States with the young suffering around the world, as I saw in Southern Africa by real experience. The Human Rights Now tour really came out of my belief that the four mandates of amnesty, which was political imprisonment, uh, anti-torture, anti-death penalty, and fair trials, was basically a pro-Western model of human rights. It was a good one. It was a good way to start. Uh, Benenson had done a good job and Sean McBride. But as you examine that structure, how many, how many were in the third world, how many in USSR at the time, which is rather big at the time, and then the United States, it favored the United States. And I wanted to break out of that mold. I wanted to, I wanted to go to the Declaration of Human Rights I, I didn't want to re, re start, start the machine as an amnesty, so that was appropriate. An amnesty supporting the declaration was appropriate, but I wanted to establish 30 articles of the Declaration of Human Rights, not just four. And I thought that would then everybody, all governments would be attacked exactly the same way then. It would be favorable to everybody in, in a human rights sense. And so we didn't do it as Amnesty. We created another organization called Center for Human Rights or something like that. And we toured the world. We, we played on all five continents to show the world that we were with the victims, that we were with the people who suffered and sitting in jails and being tortured and stuff. We were your pal. We're coming around to talk to you. We're, we're letting you know we're there. And that, that's what that tour was about. It was really to try and you know give a bright light to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights after being dusted, covered for over, I don't know how many years, by 50 by then, for 40, maybe 40, yeah. It was 40 years, we wanna take the dust off of that doc declaration because it's the spine of the human rights movement in the best written document ever in the history of the world in support of people and governments around the world. And uh, I think that's due to Eleanor Roosevelt and a Canadian John Humphrey. Uh, they they worked together powerfully well and created that document and luckily got it passed. I mean, it was very difficult to get that passed, but it actually passed. And and since then, governments have avoided it for the most part. But it was it gave a shining moment. So the Human Rights Now tour, the Chile tour, I had gotten to know in the United States, Veronica Denegri, a survivor of uh, brutality by the Pinochet regime, and she became my friend. And, and at the same time. You know, this whole time, don't forget, I meet Ferial in 81, yeah, 82, about six months after I had the job. 
So I walked up to her in Boston, and I, I'm like the new guy meeting the, you know, the members of Amnesty International. And I've never seen anybody that beautiful walk up to me. And she says to me, what's your job, you know, Mr. Healy? And I said, well, so I gave her this answer, you know, I report to the board and all that stuff. And she said, no, it's not your job. I said, what's my job then? And she said, well, you know, if, if you're not ready for this job to lower the pain level of the world, you shouldn't have this job. But your job is to lower the pain level of the world. Can you do that? Should you have this job? I've never seen a 25, 26 year old woman stun me so badly. I mean, I was like rocked by that question. It just rocked me. I mean, it just, to this day, I, it rocked me. She was so dead right, so right to say, and that would become my goal. And she became my motivator on human rights and she's 25 and knows more better than me and smarter than me. And she, you know, so she motivated me to do these things. So under all these tours is, is her. Chile was simply, they asked me, the Chile section of Amnesty asked me to come down and produce the show. I said, sure. I called Sting and I said, Sting, because he, you know, his, his mom was Catholic. He said, uh, I said to him, you know, we have to go rebaptize that stadium and with mu by music. We have to clean that stadium with music because it's the only stadium in the world, stadium in the world that has been cleansed of governmental oppression, gigantic uh, governmental oppression. And we watched it with a two-day concert. God bless Sinead. She was there and did a beautiful job. But that was the goal, was to restore, to support the restoration of democracy to Chile. And in my world tour, Chile wouldn't let me play in Chile. So I put a, a concert off uh, in northern Argentina, uh, I forget, in wine country. There's probably never been a concert there before or after. But we filled it because it was up across the border from Chile and 60,000 Chileans came across the border. So it was right before the vote against Pinochet and that uh, our mothers of the disappeared loved that. And they met us at the airport and they lined the airport for our artists to come out. Everybody's crying because, you know, we met the mothers of the disappeared. And, and there was a lot of fuss about it, but we, Veronica De Negri introduced the bands at the concert in honor of that. And, we were live on television, Latin America, Mexico, and Spain. So it was in the places where a lot of disappearances had occurred. So it was a great political move in support of human rights as well. I hope that, is that helpful? I, I yeah. love that detail in your memoirs where you describe the concert taking place in the stadium in Chile itself. And you're told by security that there are all these people wandering about and you think that they're interlopers of some type or another, only to discover that these are people looking for traces of their loved ones or who actually want to see where their loved ones actually met their end. And you just give them a free tour and you just allow them to wander. That, that was really, really a significant detail in the memoir, it seems to me. It, it was, they were putting down candles, flowers, little altars, all, all kinds of religious symbolisms of their lost ones. And, and even to this day, the beautiful thing about a stadium, no matter how important the game is, and there's a lot of important games, there are regional, you know, world playoffs and stuff. There's a whole batch of seats in the middle of the stadium that no one's allowed to sit in. It's for the disappeared. And even to this day, that that is the strength of that stadium. So people can go back and use use that stadium and not remember the abuse of Pinochet, but, you know, the victory of democracy in the country. Jack, in that Chile concert, you were at the top of the stadium with Pino, a good friend of yours, and mm -hmm. I think he was a local promoter and much more. Is that correct? Pino Sagliocco was the promoter from Spain. He's, he's with Live Nation now. He's a, he's a very brilliant, spirited promoter that I love dearly. And one thing that I remember, and I'm paraphrasing him, he said to you, as a full stadium was standing, they were emotionally in awe of what was happening and uniting as one in a way. And like you said, re-Christianing or re-baptizing, you said re-baptizing the stadium. He said, Jack, look down. That's you. You did this and we did this. And one thing I like to do in these podcasts, even one where there's such gravitas as our conversations is, I uh, sometimes look at guests' handwriting and I ask for more insights into that area. So I have your book here 
uh, and you wrote me this beautiful note to uh, oh, myself no. and my family. And one trait that stands out to me, and I love Nick's take on this, just from reading the memoir and your understanding of being a professor of history as well, your T bars, so that's your lowercase T, in some instances are very high to the top. And uh, when, I, when I did a TEDx talk and I analyzed leaders throughout history like Mandela, they had this interesting dichotomy or paradox between very high T bars, which is the visionary, and very short, like uh, low T bars, which sometimes is humility, but especially the high ones I want to focus on for a moment. When Pino said that to you, and it might be awkward because you, you are this larger than life figure to me, and yet I love you on a personal level too, as a friend and a mentor. What do you think it is about you or what did other people say about you if it's more it's easier to reflect on what other people said that made you this visionary leader that cre could create the impossible from the amnesty tours is what we're talking about, what you did in Chile that day with Pino. What do you think it is about your visionary leadership that helped Amnesty thrive, that's helped Human Rights Action Center thrive? Any cause that you put your focus on, it seems to leave the world a better place. What is it about you in terms of your visionary leadership reflecting back on your life to this point that's helped you become the leader you are? I don't really know the answer. I'll give it a try, Jamie. I think aside from my mom and burial, God gave me one wonderful special gift. It's somewhere here in my throat. Thing used to call Jack speaks with a tear in his voice. And there's a Jack two in me. And I don't know Jack two. I know Jack one. Jack one is guy that goes to the seminary, can hardly get through it, dyslexic, uh, you know, born with a, without a dad, born with a crossed eye, uh, you know, little, and my brother's 6'4", you know, it, that's Jack 1. And Jack 2 is someone that can excel and lift the stadium in uh, Wembley Stadium with my voice. No, knows he can do it, and goes, go, does it, doesn't want to do it again because he distrusts the Hitlerian quality of great speakers. I, I distrust my own voice. I don't like people being easily convinced of things, but I think it was my voice of my ability to speak that, that built amnesty. I think it, that if I had one trait that I thought was valuable is that whatever Jack two and Jack one come together, it can, he can do something um, that Jack one can't do. It's funny you say that because I'm just going back to what we were saying uh, at the start of this interview where your view of the country is is a little worried one and with good reason and i think mine tends to be optimistic but if i'm optimistic it's not just because of the demographics i think it's it's partly because of stories like yours because you really you were not born with a silver spoon in your mouth you didn't go to the right schools you you didn't know people when you were growing up your future was very very uncertain and one person, one individual, right, working behind the scenes can really just quite legitimately have explained to him uh, by Pino that this this is very much a, a result of your efforts. And it seems to me that I certainly hope this is the case. There are many, many Jack Healy's right now in different parts of West Virginia and Wisconsin and Massachusetts and here in Canada, too, who they're not even aware of what they can do. And, and yet when called upon to do the right thing, somehow they'll do the heavy lifting. And I, I think if only for that reason, your, your memoir is really just such a monument, a really solid monument. I think the pedo thing on top of that stadium, which, which he appreciated as well, was that I had brought in the new kids on the block, which with the other musicians were not seen as heavyweights. They were seen as like fluffy musicians that weren't too serious. We're doing well, but, you know, weren't in the serious category of serious musicians. And I brought them because I knew that would bring the young out completely because they were a rage down there. And that meant that the children of the soldiers of Pinochet, the, you know, because ur urban, usually the, in, in oppression in the third world, it's usually in the urban areas, not in the rural areas, because the government can't control. They're weak out there. They're, they control in the cities. And I wanted the children of Pinochet's people would be, would be in that stadium and would hear the new kids on the block, and it would dazzle them 
that we had them there and they had a message for them. And sure enough, they delivered that and the same, and that happened. In Chile, I, I don't know whether this fits or not, uh, but I, I called on Wendt Marsalis to play in Chile. And he said, Jack, you know, I'll be glad to support you. I, I like what you do. And he said, but you know, maybe I wouldn't, we wouldn't fit in, we're jazz. We, we play jazz, we, we, we don't play rock. And I said, I, I know that. I said, but you know, Henry Kissinger was the dirty hand of the Americans in the history of Pinochet when they toppled Allende. And I want, I want the Chileans to see the clean hand of Americans. And I said, because jazz is the clean hand of the Americans because it was invented primarily the black population, but also white. And it is the clean hand of the Americans. And I want them to see the clean hand after the dirty hand toppled that government. I want them to see the, that clean hand. And, you, and jazz represents that to me. He said, I'll go for you. No problem, Jack. So we get down there. And they follow, you know, probably the new kids on the block. I forget exactly who they follow, but they follow a big band, a noisy band. And they got out there, they walked out there, and that first note they played, that stadium lifted off the ground because they were playing a tune that, that, that I don't know, I don't know what it was. And I asked everybody in Spanish, does anybody speak English? And they said, he's playing a tune that they won the world tour on, but it's actually a jazz tune. And he, he united that thing. And, it, honest to God, the, he lifted that stadium. Nobody, it was probably as popular as any band we had there. I mean, it was amazing. But I think the, the emotional moment of the song They Dance Alone, there were two songs that were great in, in all these concerts. One was Biko, which captured every night the heart of everybody. Every night, Peter would capture the heart. The other song, and it became an international anthem against, you know, whatever happened to Stephen Biko and, uh, on all of Africa, practically. And, and then Stings, They Dance Alone is about the disappeared. And the first time the mothers of the disappeared met the mothers of Argentina, met the ones from Chile, was in a Sting concert in that little town in Northern Argentina. That was the first time they ever met. It was quite an emotional moment. You'll see that on screen someplace. But that too became a national anthem, uh, international anthem against uh, disappearances uh, by Sting's performance. Uh, and that song, They Dance Alone. Jack, you have a uh, step-granddaughter named Layla. What message or what's the legacy you want her to know about you and the work you've done? I want her to repeat her grandmother's love of the poor. I want her to understand that the bottom have to fight up. We have to energize them. We have to let them know we know they're there, no matter what you're what station you have in life. You have to rally to them and keep an eye on them and see how they view the world as well as yourself. Don't come from a privileged point of view. Come from a poor point of view. What, what works? Uh, sometimes I say, God help the poor once the rich will arrive. I mean, it's, it's a disaster usually. But uh, I, her mother, her grandmother had that. God, I didn't want it was. I mean, it, it was such a deep love of anything that was lesser she had a love of it and she could move it she would talk to it every waiter every every poor person she ever ran into she was she spent time with she just had a love of of that population which i i share but not as deep as wide as that one <laughs> it was amazing and she saw suffering in bosnia so she learned sober creation so she could talk to the rape victims uh, in their own language, because she too was, you know, came from a Muslim background. They they all lined up to see her instead of other people. She rebuilt a factory for the war for the war victims, and the, there's 500 jobs to this day in that factory for those people. So I, I want her to absorb that justice and human rights, and but a deep love because in the long run, for both Ferio and me, we 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 live in very rich lives. We love life. Life is good to us. We feel good about ourselves. You know, we we live well, no matter what our problems are. We feel like we're we're in the right place, doing the right thing, without any braggadocia about it. But she found someone that enjoyed her values, and I found someone who shared mine. So it it worked. There's a richness to it, 
And, you know, as I look back, you know, when I left the priesthood and my family wanted me to be a doctor or a lawyer or something, you know, I said, no, I just want to do some good in the world. That's all I wanted to do. I, I was so, there was nothing else to it. There was no plan. There was no, in fact, if I wouldn't have got the job coming out of Peace Corps at, at Amnesty, I probably wouldn't know what I was going to do. I don't, I really don't know. I, I never had a plan for all this. I think after leaving Amnesty, I wanted to show myself, but also the, the world, that the small world that knows me, that one person can make a difference. And I wanted to prove I could, in a nonprofit setting, prove that one person could shake the world if you can, if, if I was able to. And I think in some ways I did that with the Taiwan case and with the Burma case. I actually had part of that shaking that went on in the world. I certainly was a I think a reasonably significant person, quiet in person, but but real. We shook Burma. Uh, Pharaoh and I actually got in to see, when Aung San Suu Kyi was under house arrest for 16 years, nobody saw her. Pharaoh and I decided how to see her. She dressed up as with a sarong on, <laughs> sat in the headquarters and waited till she saw Aung San Suu Kyi. We actually saw her under house arrest. No one could believe it when he came back. So I always had that fire that would never stop. It was amazing. And we got to see on Song City and talk to her. We talked to her for a half hour, supposedly under house arrest. I think the, the Taiwan case, we literally, I never left my basement. You know, I'd been to Taiwan a couple of times before, but I never left my basement. And when me writing, I think 26 blogs that got, that was translated into Chinese and the freedom first it got to, they were killing them in prison. And I want to get them. I sent two people over to take a look at them. They came back and said, they're killing them. So I just kept writing these blogs and it got on national television. And we actually got him into a hospital bed in the prison and we got him home. And he's home now. I mean, we could literally call him today and be part of this documentary. And he'll tell you the same story, what happened to him. And that was the ex-president of Taiwan against the Ma government, which is pro-Chinese. Now the other government came in. They're, they're pro-West. you know, West. But they were part of it. it. was so it's kind of there's a richness to that in memory. And when you, you feel rough and depressed and get you know get down, you start thinking, well, you can do that. You, that. you can lift the world if you really try. You can do that. If you were to throw yourself behind something right now, all of a sudden you're back in the saddle and you have to decide what cause it is you're going to fight, what would it be, do you think? I think it's a civil rights movement in my own country because of my devotion and friends from that community. So, Nick, I never, most people who work with me don't know what I did last because they never talk about it, but people don't know that I worked for Dick Gregory for three years. I actually did, you know, and, and traveled with him and learned an awful lot. I mean, I actually knew John Lewis. I mean, John used to call me to go shopping here because he lived about four blocks from me. I actually got to know Muhammad Ali uh, at the fight, and then he asked me to go to Germany. And I said, no, I don't want to go to Germany. <laughs> I don't like boxing. And, you know, he used to tell people that the only guy in the world that ever said no to me was Jack Healy. He wouldn't go to Germany with me <laughs> to see the fight. But he came to my concert and spoke at it. He walked up. He said, Jack, what can I, can I say anything I want today? I said, Muhammad Ali, you're Muhammad Ali. <laughs> go out there and do whatever you want. So, <laughs> and, but... These are, Fannie Lou Hamer is the Mississippi delegation that broke open the white power in Mississippi in, in democratic politics, a gigantic figure. And she was a dear friend of mine because I made her the chair of our movement. And these are people, I mean, so when I get to see, you know, Bono and Bruce Springsteen and these, some of these star people, they, people ask me, well, how did you do that? How did you have the courage to do that? I said, well, I'd already met Mom, Dick Gregory, John Lewis. Dick, you know, I, I was trained with the best uh, in my country. I was, I was ready. Jack, your book is called, once again, Create Your Future. What do you want to be celebrating 12 months from now? Well, 12 months from now, a gigantic turnout of our voting people, a gigantic turnout of massive proportions like never been seen before. I'd like to see 99% of the country vote for once. I'd like to use our democracy. I'd like to feel before I go that my country is strong at its base. 
and no cracks in it. And I want I want, I want to feel that way because I've done my best to try and get it there. You know, my small part, but that would make me happy. I think if anyone, if any of my students, I teach high school were to tell me I don't see why I should vote because my voice doesn't count. I think your memoir would be a perfect cure for that type of attitude because once again, it is, obviously you had brilliant people around you, they worked with you, but you were on your own in many instances and you did make a difference, right? There's, there's no excuse. There really is no excuse. You can do something. So maybe your maybe your dream will come true. It's possible. I'm trying to pull up a play now, which it looks like we're going to. It's about Dick Gregory and Charles Mingus in 1975. I was up arguing with Dick to he was always a runner. And I'd been on a plane with Dan, one of our famous TV personalities, Dan Rather, it was Dan Rather. And I asked him about Dick Gregory, and he said, uh, I'm leery and weary of him. And I thought, oh, damn, I got to get Dick back into the center of the dialogue of the country. I got to get him in the narrative on some serious issue. So I invented that run across the country. And with Dick, it had to be kind of big. So I said, well, what we're going to do, Dick, is steal the bicentennial, 1976. We're going to steal that bicentennial. You're going to run across the United States. We're going to talk to politicians, every poor person we can find. You're going to talk to them. I'll be the front man. I'll raise the money. Yeah, I'll do that. No problem. I said, yeah, you do the running. I'll do the talking. He said, that's, that's fine. So we did do that, and it worked. Anyway, while I'm there, Charles Mingus came to the house, and he, he told Dick he was depressed. He was sad. He was worn out. He didn't know what he was doing. And so he said, Jack, take Charlie down to the boathouse. I'll be down. Anyway, in short, I say to Mr. Mingus, what do you do, sir? <laughs> and I didn't know what he was. He almost leaped out of his chair because he thought everybody knew he was famous. <laughs> and he, he, he wanted to flip out. And so I said, well, what, how do you do that? He said, he said, I play the bass. And I said, well, how do you do that? He said, I have a orchestra in my head. I said, Jesus, you have a whole orchestra. I don't have anything in my head. And he said, yeah, when you were born, you thought you were superior to me, too. And so I thought, okay, good civil rights talk here. Anyway, Dick wakes us up at about four in the morning, puts Charlie in a chair, said, Jack, just stand around the corner and watch this. And he, he puts himself under another light with a stool and an unlit cigarette. He entertained him for the whole gig for about an hour, hour and 15 minutes conspiracy stories, racism, you know, it, it covered everything. Charlie sat in the chair laughing, howling, crying. And at the end of it said, Dick, I'm ready to die. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go back to life. And so Dick left and that's what the play is about. I'm, I'm trying to find every invigorating possibility. And with you, you fellas to do the same is it re-energized the human rights movement on a worldwide basis. Not just, not just us, but the whole world. I hope something resonates. You know, you try to put a bit of powder in the water to make a little bit different. So that's what I'm trying to do. Nick, I want to ask you as we wrap up, what did you appreciate about this conversation that the three of us had? I, I my fear was just slightly that the glitz might affect the blitz. And what I mean by that is the human rights obviously is 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 the purpose of it's been the purpose of your life and it was the purpose of these concerts and there was always a little voice just warning me well you know is everyone getting involved because they want to get a piece of bono or springsteen or sting or one of the other pieces and i was also wondering is it possible that working in such a, an orbit um, is it possible that it, it ends up not corrupting but but part of but part of the gold is is the fame and the wealth and the music and the adoration, and uh, I think I got my answer. Uh, your your it was a it was a means to an end. It really was a means to an end, and the end is so noble uh, that it actually transformed the means from something that could be somewhat base into something golden as well. Really, I, I it's it's been such a pleasure meeting you, Jack. Truly, well, thank you, Nick. Thank you. I yeah, appreciate I that. I, yeah. And I'll add that uh, knowing Jack for 25 years and speaking to him for hours on end and reading his works and volunteering for uh, various causes that he's participated in, even helping edit a chapter in this book. What I was hoping from this short session 
which is just coming on just over an hour, was uh, reminded me of Citizen Kane, where one of the journalists who's looking at the life of Citizen Kane in that movie says, I've realized that you can't define a life on a word or you can't define a life on a on a few on a sentence. It's impossible to sum up such a rich life. And with Jack, my fear was with all that you've done, with all the impact you've made in the world, like you said, one person can change the world. And you are the quintessential example of that in my lifetime. I didn't want to just have a few snapshots that didn't get the bigger causes, which ultimately you devoted your life to through the work you do. And I still don't think a podcast episode can sum up a life, especially a life like Jack's and the work you've done. I think though, it's a really sound and grounded introduction and conduit into the next step which I would encourage those listening and watching on YouTube to check out the book we've referenced many times, Create Your Future. Because if there is a guidebook, if there is a call to action, you can find it in here to see what you can do to create your future and to make your community a better place in what human rights means for you. Jamie, you'll find that in your own career, I'm sure, Nick, too. However, I, I've done here, it's also the quality of the person asking me the question. I am not joking about it. I I can do a lot of podcasts. I've never done one this good. So thank you very much for being prepared and knowing your stuff. And I mean, this has been, it's been a real joy for me. Usually I struggle to work at it and do my best, but this is like, you lit me up emotionally at least 10 times. And, Thank God I didn't cry. You don't want to see an Irishman crying. <laughs> it's a terrible scene. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. It was really great. It was really fun. Really, if you, it was great. Thank you, Nick. If you want to hear more or learn more about Jack Healy, please go to Human Rights Action Center online and you can find out more about the work that he's done and the work that he will continue to do on human rights to see how you can get involved and help. I'm Jamie Mason Cohen. And I am the host of the Signature Leadership Show. Thank you. And subscribe if you have a chance.